I am Glenn Carson. Uh, I grew up in the Philadelphia area. Um, my uh, dad's parents both came from Ireland. His mother from County Cavan, his father from County Antrim, lived just a few miles from the Giants Causeway and the Bush Mills factory. Um, and then my mom, uh, her family was, was Scottish. Uh, her grandfather came from Scotland in 1897. And um, the family that my mother was from came from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And there was a number of farmers like uh, my grandmother's sisters, some married farmers and or were farmers, her brothers. And then, uh, so I did spend some time growing up um, out of my great uh, uncle Luce uh, and Ann Esther's farm near Sellersville, Pennsylvania. That was important to me. Uh, that was a real um, connection with all kinds of work, things working with your hands, you know, they did everything themselves. So the other person I guess would be key would be my grandfather. That would be my dad's dad. And he was named after him, Thomas Carson. So he was a carpenter, and I liked the John Prine song. <laughs> Grandpa was a carpenter. My grandfather was a carpenter. He worked in the Philadelphia shipyard too. And uh, um, so he worked with wood, I think, you know, much of his life. And pretty simple tools. I mean, I have his uh, toolbox, which is an old-fashioned, just simple box. He had a couple of those with hand saws and hammers and stuff like that. I mean, he wasn't a he wasn't a cabinet maker or anything like that. But he he did, you know, he was very proficient and did additions and just about anything with wood. And I think he was a, a, good, a real good craftsman. My dad, on the other hand, had no mechanical skills whatsoever that I could ever see. He just wasn't, that wasn't his thing. So kind of jumped a generation there. I joke and tell people that uh, I switched from uh, Jimi Hendrix to Doc Watson, kind of turned off the radio and never turned it back on. In, uh, in like 1974, 1975, uh, I've, I've been a reader my whole life since I was a little kid. I love to read and, and learn a lot of things that way. So I was in a bookstore and I discovered the Foxfire books. And um, I bought number three. It had just come out, just brand new. And it had this section on mountain dulcimers and banjos. And I knew nothing about any of that stuff. Uh, but I was really drawn to these banjos for some reason. I thought it was pretty interesting. You know, I read about Stanley Hicks and, and Leonard Glenn and, and um, you know, a couple other builders in that book. So I, I uh, decided I was going to build a banjo. And I had a couple of my grandfather's hand tools, no, but literally no tools. Um, I had an egg beater drill, hand drill. I had a four four-way rasp file that was half round and one side and flat on the other side and coarse and fine. And I had a rat tail file, a pocket knife, and a coping saw, and a block plane. And that's that was the extent of my tools. So I uh, I looked for a source of wood and I saw an ad in the Harrisburg Patriot News and um, there was somebody advertising hardwoods in there, maple and the walnut and, and some other woods. And it turns out it was George Orthy, who lived in Newport, Pennsylvania. And George became very well known as an auto harp maker, made, I think, over 20 auto harps for members of the Carter families. Anyway, I, I went up and George was an army veterinarian and, and I bought my first wood from George. He doesn't remember that. Um, and this was long before he started making auto harps. He was making lap dulcimers at the time. And, uh, but that was a really good connection. George and I were still friends to this day. And uh, so uh, the, I, made, uh, I made banjo number one, copying Stanley Hicks's banjo in Foxfire 3. And uh, went to a music store to buy strings and and then met another lifelong friend, Bob Buckingham, when I bought the strings 
for that first banjo. So uh, that started the what we now laughingly call the Carson banjo family tree. Uh, and that's why I'm still doing this. It connected me with people. I started to meet some really interesting people that I really enjoyed being around, both for the music and the craftsman side of it. In the 70s, as some of the older guys that have been doing this for a while can tell you, there were very, very few resources. I mean, there was a couple books out. Eric, uh, Eric Sloan's book. Um, really wasn't much. I mean, and for banjo building, I mean, <laughs> it was, the Foxfire book is the only one thing I saw. Um, and I searched uh, and tried to find somebody else who was doing it, and I, I really couldn't find anybody. Uh, until I met Bob Campbell, who owned a music store in Spry, Pennsylvania, outside of York. And he helped me, introduced me to Chris Warner, and gave me Reed Martin's contact information. So that started the Reed Martin connection in probably late 1975. When I went to Reed's house and, and went to Campbell's Music and, and met Bob Buckingham, and I met him at Mark Sherman's Home of Bluegrass, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which was the local uh, watering hole for all things acoustic and jams. And, and I'm still playing music with another friend that I met there, a good fiddle player named Kirk Devins. So, um, you know, these connections last a long time when you, when you make a good one. So, um, I, after I made a couple fretless banjos, I, I wanted to make like a real banjo, a fretted banjo. And so, I scrounged some parts, some old parts, and by that time uh, discovered Stuart McDonald. They were in business then, early, you know, earlier days, and, and I bought some parts from that. Um, in Fred Banjo number one, I didn't understand why fret, uh, inlays were where they were. I inlaid it every other fret. <laughs> I mean, I was totally clueless because there was not an internet, there was nothing. I had not even really seen a good banjo close up in person. I mean, I briefly in a music store, but not a chance to really study them while I was home trying to build this thing. So, yeah, pretty bad and definitely school hard knocks. But I saw a few um, photos and I met a, uh, a couple older tenor banjo players and I saw a couple Vegas, uh, you know, which just grabbed me, you know, that the, uh, like a number nine Vega uh, tenor and plectrum banjo. And I just thought they were the most beautiful instrument I'd ever seen. You know, they just loved the wood and the metal and just the combination of all that stuff. So next thing I knew, I was trying to figure out how to do some of that, that other stuff associated with banjos because it fascinated me. And um, I wanted to try engraving, but there I really struck out with any information. So. I went to a couple gun shops because that's what people told me I had to do. If you want to learn, if you want to get it, find out where to get engraving tools, go to a gunsmith and ask. So I went to a gunsmith, a local guy who built hunting rifles and restored shotguns. I asked him if he could sell me some engraving tools, and he asked me why I wanted that, and I said I made banjos. So he he wanted to see one. So I I went back and took one in there, and he wanted me to come work for him because I guess he, was, he needed a, somebody to work on uh, the wood side of these rifles he was making. So um, I, I eventually ended up doing that for a couple of years and I and actually at that time I enjoyed it. It was I got to work with some really nice wood and as a woodworker it was pretty fulfilling. And it was fun, you know, doing work with the metal. And I learned a lot, and it kind of really um, upped my game, woodworking game, really quick, because the level of craftsmanship that I had to do um, was serious, and I had to, re like, really, really focus and, and, and really uh, work hard at it. And it was, a, it was a couple guys there that showed me some things, and. And so, you know, I learned myself, but with help from a few other people. Within a five-year period, I had jumped from the fretless mountain-style banjos to like a pretty ornate tenor with engraving and 
lots of inlay and all that stuff because at the time that was that was kind of what you strove for and um, so I made some pretty ornate stuff back then um, and still learn how to play so I was you know young married um, and uh, I was trying to figure out how to play music I was trying to learn the fiddle the mandolin the guitar and claw hammer banjo while I was trying to learn to build instruments and work a full-time job. So. <laughs> I haven't done it as part of my living for a long time. So I haven't had the pressure that a lot of full-time builders have to make their living with it. That's time. That, that's, I, I probably put more time in than, than some people because I haven't had to, uh, you know, churn, make a lot. And so I've never made a lot, you know, I've really, I've been doing it for 45 years, but, you know, my production is not that high because I looked at each one kind of a, as an individual project and I've never made two the same. Um, never totally standardized because I like, playing around with sound and um, scales and pot diameters and depths and different tone systems and all that. That's what I love about open back banjos. That's really why I fell in love with them really early on. I mean, I love bluegrass banjos. I find that interesting, but from the earliest, I was, I liked open back banjos because there's just a huge amount of freedom with making them. I mean, I basically no restrictions with the kind of wood I use or even the diameter and all that stuff. You're just not locked in. And I always liked that. I mean, all, all my banjos, even from the 70s on, were all different. And I tried wacky stuff way back when. I mean, the first bluegrass banjo I did, I did wire inlay with dental amalgam silver. <laughs> not proud of some of that stuff, but I was learning. And it was a different time too. I mean, pre there's there's pre-internet and there's internet times and radical, radical, radical change in how it's, we all approach it and how quick the learning curve is and the sharing of knowledge and information. I mean, early on, I could not find any engravers who would tell me anything. It took me many, many years to learn how to sharpen a graver, like with the, what's called a heel on the face of it and some other things. It just wasn't, wasn't much information and it was minimal sharing unless you, you know, found somebody and they were willing to talk. And ge the geographic thing was a, a limit. I was always making a living and busy and didn't have a lot of chance to travel and go meet other people. So around where we lived, there, there wasn't very many resources. I'm transitioning, uh, transitioning from full-time work to part-time work, semi-retirement, so to speak. I'm 65, I'll be 66 very soon. And um, I've been looking forward to having some time to really actually focus on making a few instruments like I w really want to make them with some time. And I've never had long blocks of time ever. Um, so um, I have a lot of ideas to make some banjos. I have a lot of parts. Um, and uh, I'm just going to make a few the way I want to make them and put them out and see if anybody's interested. But mostly, and I got a couple to build for myself too. <laughs> I'm tickled to be in a shop that's dry after the first um, 36 years. We're in a shop that had, I had to run two dehumidifiers 24 seven and it was a challenge. And so we moved about six years ago and uh, I have a dry shop which is awesome and good be better lighting better organization but it's not the best for like traditional woodworking so it, it, I have a garage door and I have all my tools on wheels and I can roll them outside um, I'd like to have a little more room maybe um, I'm working on your mother I'm gonna commandeer the rest of the basement here <laughs> As soon as our grandkids get a little older, they don't need that area. I'm just going to move in there. So <laughs> she doesn't know that, so she can't see this part. Craig Evans did a really great thing when he did his banjo builders 
series. I mean, I thought that was the most awesome 60th birthday present to himself and the, and the whole Luthier's world that you could have done. I mean, that really grew into a, an enormous project and was really cool. So again, it's post internet or, you know, having the internet is the inform the spread of information has been incredible. You can find out anything you want a uh, story and I'm, I'm a little rabbit trail, but I made a Paramount E five string neck in the seventies and it took me a long time um, because I could not find an example of a Paramount E neck to copy inlays. I just couldn't find anybody that had one. And it took me a couple years. You know, it was one of those things that just drug out and drug out and drug out. And finally found an, an older collector in Florida who had one and he took it to the library and, um, put his banjo on the photocopier and made a photocopier, strings and everything on. But I finally got a, the shapes and com confirmation of a Paramount Model E, and that's how it, ha how it happened. And it literally took years. And I can get on my phone now, and I can find that in about four seconds. So that's how radically different. I mean, we're talking about four years versus four seconds, <laughs> if you're good with your, with your thumbs. So... The guys now have just an incredible amount of information. And uh, I guess I just encourage them to not rush, um, take their time, you know, um, do the best job you can do that you can be proud of. I mean, that uh, it's not a race. And, uh, you know, make something that, that you're, you'll be happy with for a long time. I made some stuff early on that I would love to take back and burn for fuel this winter. Um, study as much good work as you can, but do your own thing, you know, not, don't copy. You know, there's, there's some young, a lot of young guys who are incredible builders. I mean, they're just gotten so good so quick because they have the world at their fingertips. They can find out how to do things. And, and it's, I can really see it. I mean, they've gotten very good, very quick. Same as the players. I mean, it's just incredible how that's changed things. So, you know, make it your own. I, I guess that's a, that's a, something I encourage. I mean, um, I draw. I, I have literally file cabinets, portable boxes and boxes full of drawings. And so I just sketch when I'm on the phone at work. I mean, I sketch. It doesn't. It helps me concentrate when I'm talking to, on the phone if I draw. So I just draw, and uh, so I make many copies of things, and I draw, and practice. And so, a lot of inlay engraving or carving. I'll draw three, four patterns, either on the neck with light pencil or on the inlay with a three thousandths of an inch ink pen. And if I don't like it, I wipe it off. And sometimes. It really clicks, and other times I might have to take seven, eight shots at it until I get something that really works. So, um, you know, some there's times where it may take as much time to plan it and design it as it does to do it. If you're looking to make something special, I mean, and I have nothing against just making a basic instrument because the world needs a lot of that, and, and there's a lot of really good banjos being built now. So, you know, I just say take pride in what you're doing, and you know, make it each one better than the last.